hello, welcome uh, to Talk to Thinker show. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to uh, to be on the show. Great. Um, well, Cheryl, I'd like to, if we could begin with the uh, at the beginning of your life, and if you could give us some sense of you know where you grew up and what kind of family you grew up in. I grew up in a place called Lethbridge, Alberta. Uh, most people won't have heard of it. For for Americans, uh, uh, a good indicator is that it's within cycling distance of uh, Sweetgrass, Montana. So very near the Montana border. A really beautiful place where the prairies meet the mountains. And uh, I was born and raised there, uh, went to university there, and actually was was just yesterday, uh, I was driving uh, past Fort McLeod where Joni Mitchell was uh, born and blasting Joni Mitchell at 5 a.m. on the way to the uh, Calgary airport. Uh, So that's that's the the kind of uh, place that I was uh, born and raised. And uh, was it um, a rural community or was it, uh, you know, is it a city or a big town? It's the big town for a very rural community. So Lethbridge is kind of the shopping district for all the farmers in in the district. Okay. But it's, it's, it's a very small city. So it was 50,000 people when I, grew, when I grew up there. Okay. And um, what kind of people were your parents? And did you have siblings or do you have siblings? I, I do have siblings. My parents uh, were very working class. My father sold automotive parts and uh, my mother was a school teacher, although she, uh, she, she took off many, many years to raise four kids. So I have two brothers and a sister. And uh, none of them live in Lethbridge anymore, although my parents uh, still live there. Um, as, as Joni Mitchell, uh, one of her best songs is called An Urge for Going. And I think a lot of people uh, born in small places like Lethbridge have an urge for going. Is Joni Mitchell one of your heroes? or? I, I, I like her, but it just so happens that I was thinking of her driving through Fort McLeod yesterday. So she's okay. on my mind. <laughs> Very good. Um was was um was education a big a big priority for your parents or was that something you you discovered yourself and did off your own bat? My parents are immigrants uh, from Eastern Europe and uh, their parents really immigrated. So my parents are first generation Canadians, and it really is the the kind of typical immigrant story. The way to get ahead is that your your children would go to university, would get a good education and and in the new country, you know, that that's how you made your way. And uh, and so my my parents, my mother especially, really insisted that, well, insisted is the wrong word. There was there was no question but that all the kids would go to university. Okay. And was that a challenge given your parents were working class? I mean, or did you have to get a scholarship? Was that or was that always they would make sacrifices? Not not so many sacrifices because the Canadian way, uh, of course, there are pockets uh, in of Canada where this isn't the Canadian way. But generally, the Canadian way has been to send uh, your children to university in your hometown if there's a university in your hometown. So in the 19, early 1960s, I think uh, the University of Lethbridge was was built. Uh, it was a it was part of a wave of university building in the 60s very small university my parents were just overjoyed when it came into being because then they didn't have to make these sacrifices to send their kids to university because the children would just uh, live at home while going to university so that's it's, as i say it's a it's a pretty big thing in Canada where you go to university in your hometown, unlike the UK where the, where the culture has been that you go away for university, even if you have a great university on your doorstep. Yes. And quite the same in America as well. Yes. As I can see most kids in America go somewhere else. Um, Okay. Very good. So you, um, what's striking, I suppose the first thing that strikes me when I look at your, you know, your biography, is that you you did your first degree in in philosophy so you know uh, you, you obviously knew or suspected that that's what you wanted to do even before you went to university 
No, not at all. <laughs> oh, okay, so correct, my, correct the record. <laughs> so I, I quite literally did not know what the word philosophy meant. And as in, in my first year, before my first year, we were all lining up in the, in the gym to choose our courses because of course this was before things were online. And uh, I uh, was a real brat. I wanted to go and play in tennis tournaments. Uh, so I wanted long weekends. So I, I wanted Tuesday and Thursday courses only. And there was one gap uh, left in my calendar and, uh, and this course philosophy uh, would fit. And I thought I made the mistake that many people do. I thought, is that psychology? Uh, I don't know. And I, I put it, I literally filled it in my calendar because it fit. And then in my first class, uh, I, my eyes kind of opened wide and I thought, oh, wow, I like this. So I found out what philosophy was and found out that I liked it uh, in the same, in the same moment. Wow. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's, well, that's interesting that in other words, after your first class, you, it, it, you made a connection. So even though you hadn't heard of, or you didn't really know what philosophy is or was, you, there was obviously some sort of philosopher inside you, uh, if, if you made that connection so fast. So wh how, how did that manifest itself? Or how, how, how was that even there before you went to university, do you think? Well, if you think of philosophy as, as the discipline that you know, really tries to get to the bottom of things and ask for reasons for everything. I suppose that must have been what appealed to me. Although I don't think anyone would have identified that in in me as a as a child. Uh, but it definitely appealed to me so much so that uh, really quite quickly all my other classes seemed far less interesting, and uh, I took so many philosophy classes. The way I got around the uh, breadth requirements is I took a lot of independent studies, which didn't count uh, as, a, as, as part of your breadth requirement. I took 12 independent studies. And immediately afterwards, the University of Lethbridge changed the rules on independent studies. Um, so it, it, you know, it really grabbed me, must have been just because of the reason asking and giving nature of the discipline, but it was a it was a surprise to me. Okay, very good. Um, now, to people who aren't familiar with philosophy, uh, it's it's a huge area. You know, uh, you know, from metaphysics, which studies the nature of reality, right through to moral and political philosophy, which has a much more pra practical uh, focus. Um, when you started studying philosophy, were there branches of the subject that particularly appealed to you, or were you looking at, you always looked at it in the, in the, in the main? I was keen on everything, although I became very keen towards the end of my undergraduate degree on the work of the founder of American pragmatism, Charles Sanders Peirce. There was something magical about diving into a thinker. So Peirce uh, died in 1914. So most of his writing was in the late uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, and he uh, he was an outsider. He was a really difficult man, and he never managed to hold down an academic job. So he worked for the uh, the U.S. Coast Survey as a as a as a scientist for quite a long time. He got fired from that as well. And he ended up uh, sitting in his attic for, for decades, just writing out this uh, very interesting, very complete architectonic system of philosophy. And it was very, very hard to get, and it still is very, very hard to worm one's way into Peirce's thought because he never, uh, had had to be a disciplined thinker. He didn't write a book. He published very few papers, and that, and that makes us write for an audience, right? And and that makes us write an introduction and think about exactly what we want to say and write a conclusion. Instead, you've just got these thousands and thousands of pages of person's scrawled manuscripts to try to piece together, you know, what he really really thought. 
and and that appealed to me. So I, 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 uh, I'm very much uh, someone who works in the history of philosophy as well as in all of those um, um, other streams of philosophy like epistemology or theory of knowledge, like moral philosophy. One of the great things about being a philosopher is that you can, you, you can follow your nose and get into all manner of uh, topics. And, and I have, I've, I've really roamed around the whole landscape of philosophy. Not all of it, but a big chunk of it. Okay, very interesting. Um, and was there, did you have a mentor in the University of Lethbridge that led you to Pierce or did, was, this a self, was this a discovery you made yourself? I did have a mentor. Uh, he he was very interested in purse and uh and he's the person i took most of these 12 independent studies with uh his name uh, was michael is michael kabara uh also hasn't published much like purse uh and uh and i worked a lot with him so when i left the university of lethbridge i already had a a pretty clear sense of what i wanted to do for graduate school that's not to say that it, that the graduate school uh, question was easily answered by me. I, I agonized over it. So you know, if, you, if you're from uh, a working class background, you go to university, you go to university in order to get a job that, uh, that is going to, you know, as I said, lift you up a little, <laughs> lift your family up a little. And philosophy at the time and now certainly didn't look like that. My parents were great about it. Um, so I, I, was, I was intending to go to law school and and they were very happy about that but then i got the philosophy bug and and then agonized about whether i should go to graduate school in philosophy my parents were great about it they also didn't know what philosophy was but they didn't try to you know push me off of of my path but it was a time uh in, in which the american philosophy association required of every american graduate school to send to every applicant every person who wanted to go to graduate school, a letter, a form letter that more or less said, it's great that you want to study uh, <clears throat> philosophy at the graduate level, but you'd, you'd better understand that uh, there's not a job at the end of this. Hmm. So if you want to do this, fantastic, but don't do it because you want a job, there aren't any. So it was really uh, grim to when you applied to American schools to get, to get this, <laughs> this uh, letter from them. Uh, but I went into it with my eyes open, knowing that it was highly unlikely that one would get a job. And unfortunately, that, you know, that remains the case today. Yes, and I mean, um, well, I mean, on one level, those letters were quite, were, were quite sobering, but also quite responsible because they didn't want people of illusions, I imagine. But before we, we go to your graduate studies, I would like, you know, so during your time at university, when you were studying philosophy, um, and you were obviously passionate about it, um, did it change how you looked at the world in a practical way? Did it make you more questioning or subversive? Or did it even create tensions within your family because you stopped maybe taking things for granted that we tend to take for granted when we're growing up? I think I was always pretty questioning and subversive. And, and this goes back to one of your earlier questions. So I, I, I suppose I was uh, uh, made for philosophy in that, uh, you know, I, I was brought up Catholic and at, at about the age of 14. And I was a very, I was a very good Catholic. I went, you know, went uh, early in the morning and, you know, laid the uh, things up for the, the, priest for the 7.30 a.m. mass, uh, you know, I went to some Catholic weekend camps. Um, the, my family was, you know, was uh, church going every Sunday. But at, at about the age of 14, I thought, just it struck me, maybe it was even younger than 14. Hey, um, everyone in every other religion believes in their God as much as I believe in mine, and that can't be right. I, the reason I believe in God is just that I grew up in this family, in this tradition, and I, just instantly I stopped believing, like on a dime. And, uh, and so in these ways, I think that, uh, as I say, I was probably suited, well suited for philosophy. Okay. 
Well, I wanted the reason, and if the reason wasn't there, I just stopped believing. Okay, fair enough. I mean, were you a kind of um, a kind of a quiet rebel, or were you are you someone that uh, heralds your you know your contrarian views? I mean, were you rebellious to your parents, or you just keep this knowledge to yourself? I wasn't particularly rebellious, but obviously, if you stop going to church, you can't uh, you can't keep that. Uh, to yourself. My parents were very easy about it. Actually, I think they were um, probably waning in, in their own beliefs at the at the time. Um, but I, I wasn't in anyone's face about uh, my newfound atheism. Uh, but I, uh, but obviously, I, I stopped doing the things that one did as a believer. Yes, sure. Okay, very good. I mean, then you you, you graduate with the with the distinction at the University of Lethbridge. So you'd obviously were academically uh, very talented. Uh, and from there, you know, you go to um, Columbia University in New York, which must have been a massive move going from Lethbridge to, you know, uh, one of the most famous cities in the world. Um, before we talk ab about Columbia, um, can you maybe recall how you felt when you <laughs> arrived on the train or by plane in New York and how you found that city, finding your feet there? Yeah, so I had traveled very, very little um, and certainly never to a city like New York. And, and it was pretty overwhelming. And you have to remember, this is the New York of 1983. It's not the, the safe, uh, clean New York <laughs> that, we, that we know today. It was, the first uh, meeting of all the graduate students, the head of graduate studies, you know, gives the usual kind of welcoming uh, remarks. And he said, his, his remarks were uh, perhaps not so welcoming. The, the main point of them was uh, to uh, tell us that we must be safe in New York. And the year before, uh, PhD student in the Columbia philosophy department. So this is a story we were told the year, last year. Uh, uh, well, first you have to understand that uh, muggings are just a transaction. You get mugged, you just, you just turn over your wallet, whatever you're asked for, and it's done. Last year, a uh, graduate student in the philosophy department was mugged as are so many and uh, uh, the mugger the transaction was done, the mugger turned around and the graduate student said, hey, you forgot this. And he flipped the guy a quarter and he was shot dead. And the moral was, don't be smart with muggers. So <laughs> it, was, it, was, uh, it was not like Lethbridge, Alberta. Uh, but, it, but in many ways, I, I, I love being in the city. The, the, the philosophy department at Columbia during that time was not very happy. I had found uh, very quickly someone who uh, was wonderful for me to work with. That was Isaac Levi, uh, recently, unfortunately, departed from this world. Uh, he was very interested in pragmatism, very, very New Yorker, very rough and, and gruff, um, although he wasn't born and, braised, uh, uh, born and bred in New York. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't a happy place and one could feel that right away. So even though I had uh, gone there to do a PhD, I ended up just uh, staying for one year doing a uh, MPhil and then I went to Oxford. Okay. I mean, what, what originally attracted you to Columbia? Was it Isaac Levi or was it just you wanted to go there to New York? So this was, this was in the days before internet, before any information about any school, except for little, you know, kind of brochures that might be hanging around a philosophy department, but not many brochures were sent to the University of Lethbridge philosophy department. So, so quite literally, I applied to some schools that I had heard of. Uh, and, and those were the, the big US schools. Um, I, so when I was an undergraduate, my last year, Columbia, Harvard, Princeton, I mean, literally that kind of small, yeah. out of reach, I thought, handful. Um, I applied for a Rhodes Scholarship uh, to go to Oxford, was shortlisted um, and didn't get it. 
uh, although the the roads committee called me afterwards and said, look, I think you should apply next year. Um, and in the interview, you have to be a little bit more confident. You can't uh, you can't be you can't be self deprecating <laughs> in, the, in the interview. Uh, and uh, and then I applied to one Canadian school and I got into Columbia and the Canadian school. And so it was just, well, I'll, you know, go to the best school that takes you. So I went to Columbia. Okay, very good. I mean, was um, you mentioned Isaac Levi, another philosopher that I'm thinking there would have been there and actually was well known for his work on pragmatism was Sidney Morgan Bezer. Did you come across him when you were there? For sure. Absolutely loved Sydney. I never thought that what he had to say about pragmatism uh, was very good or helpful. Whereas Isaac uh, really was absolutely top drawer in thinking about uh, about pragmatism generally as a philosophical position, but also thinking about person and Dewey. But Sydney was, was just wonderful. He was warm, the funniest person I've uh, funniest person er anywhere I've ever met, and uh, and I and I stayed in touch with him uh, as I did with Isaac for well until he died. Okay, um, it's funny because I mean uh, my reason for mentioning that was the first time I'd heard the word pragmatism was through Brian McGee's interview with Sidney Morgan Besser, who talked about pragmatism. That was his main reason for being on the what was called, I think, Men of Ideas, even though there was, I was a murderer. But um, so in a way, he became actually the, the official voice of pragmatism for a lot of us who were introduced to it. And yet it's interesting what you say, you, you thought he was, he had got it wrong, or he wasn't as authoritative on it as you would have thought he should have been, or? Well, S Sydney had a massive writing block, so he never wrote much. Uh, and and what he did write was often, I mean, we're, and we're talking very, very few things, was often co-authored with people like Isaac Levi. So this paper on dispositions and, and pragmatism kind of. And, uh, but you know, that's mostly Isaac coming through there, I think. Uh, Sidney was a, was a excellent critic of pragmatism. And so one of his famous quips, so pragmatism is the view that rather than start with abstract concepts of truth and morality and objectivity, we need to start with human beings and their beliefs and their, their ways of uh, behaving and their practices. So pragmatism tries to bring the highly abstract down to earth. And Sidney's quip about pragmatism, one of the many, many quips for which he is famous, is that, well, pragmatism works well in theory, but not in practice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've heard of that one, all right. Yes, yes. He, uh, uh, he was very good for those wise, wise cracks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, that, that's, um, that's interesting. In fact, now that you say that, that they co-authored, because he and uh, Jonathan Laberson, Laberson wrote, co-authored mm -hmm. quite two very good essays on Isaiah Berlin, which uh, were published in the New York Review of Books. But again, it, it confirms what you said. He he was obviously keen on co-authoring, especially I suppose if he had a writer's block. Um, okay, so you, you you do your graduate work in um, under Isaac Levi. You obviously your knowledge of pragmatism and uh, became deeper, and from there you go to Oxford. Um, I think as a Rhodes Scholar, eventually you get there. Um, tell us how you found Oxford as a place first. I absolutely loved it on, on first sight. I mean, it's beautiful, but also it, it, it was a more attractive way of being for me. So New York was just very, you know, the Columbia philosophy department was very New York. Um, uh, it, it, was, it was like the decibel theory of truth uh, reigned. So, the, you know, everyone shouted, it was, it was aggressive uh, and, and very competitive, uh, you know, I often worked in the law library. And, and so this wasn't the case in the philosophy department, but you just had this feeling of competition everywhere. I worked in the law library and students, when they went to the loo, they would pack up every bit of their notes and take them with them instead of leaving them on the desk because they were worried that someone was going to try to sabotage their work or steal it or something. Um, and 
And Oxford was just the opposite. Uh, it, it seemed very, uh, very warm and people were working together, people wanting to uh, figure things out together. Uh, it seemed more deliberative than, uh, than you know, loud and, and aggressive. Um, you know, perhaps I was wrong about that. Perhaps I just, you know, fell into a very nice group of people instantly, but, but very, very quickly, like on day one, I realized, okay, this is the place for me, at least the place for me in the broader intellectual uh, way. So the, Oxford is not, um, not a, a, a place that is known for pragmatism, although I think it ought to be. Right now I'm writing, I just started to write a book called Oxford Pragmatism, <laughs> where I want to show how Ryle and Austin and all the ordinary language philosophers really got uh, a, a, a heavy dose of pragmatism, mostly through Frank Ramsey, but also through the American C.I. Lewis and Peirce. Anyway, I'll, I'll make, perhaps we'll get into that later. But at the time, it was not known as, as, uh, as a place where one could work on pragmatism. And Isaac Levi had, uh, had said to me that I was mad to be leaving John Dewey's department at Columbia and going to Oxford where people hated pragmatism. But that wasn't the case. I and and but actually Michael Dummett, who was head of the the philosophy subfaculty at the time, when I had my introductory meeting with Dummett, he also said, Why did you come here? There's there aren't people who really work on pragmatism. And I said to him, Well, actually, David Wiggins has has uh written a sentence here or there that really makes it clear that he understands purse. And so I, I, I did have that one uh, slender thread to pull on that there was some uh, pragmatism going on at Oxford. Okay, um, interesting. I mean, one of the things that, and it's kind of confirmed there, uh, you know, about the people you're mentioning, they're all men. Um, and did you find that philosophy was mainly a, a male uh, activity in Oxford or how did you find that that side of things? Well, there, there were um, quite a few women philosophers in Oxford and actually I was supervised uh, in part by, uh, by a woman who wasn't at Oxford. So eventually um, I made contact with David Wiggins and he, he said, yes, indeed, I'm really interested in purse really think there's a, a lot of, uh, of good to be found in pragmatism. But he, he said, I just, I'm not a purse scholar. I wanted to write my dissertation on Purse's theory of truth. So uh, David said, look, there are two great purse scholars in the UK, Susan Hack, who was at Warwick at the time, and Chris Hookway, who was at Birmingham at the time. So he said, I'm happy to supervise you, but you should be co-supervised by one of them. And just being very naive, uh, I wrote them both a letter on the same day, uh, thinking that it, would, that, that it was a long shot, uh, uh, that either of them would agree to co-supervise me. And uh, they both wrote back and said, sure, happy to. So I had, I had the most wonderful supervisory team. I had David Wiggins, who is, just one of the deepest, uh, smartest philosophers in the last couple of generations, I want to say. Um, I had Susan Hack, who is indeed a brilliant purse scholar and, and logician, and Chris Hookway, also like a fantastic purse scholar. So I, I really, I had a, a supervisory dream team. Wow, that's, um, that's incredible to have that kind of, uh... As you say, those three supervisors, and um, I mean, I'm very familiar with uh, Wiggins's work, uh, especially you know his, the pieces in uh, Needs, Truth, and uh, what was it called? Uh, Value. Needs, Values, and Truth, yeah. which I agree with you. I think he's one of the great philosophical minds, uh, completely original uh, and very infinitely interesting. Um, so, so that was great too. Those three supervisors. Uh, can you talk a little bit about? Uh, what Hack uh, and Hookway brought to the table for you. Maybe talk a little bit about their style and how they deepened your knowledge of pragmatism. 
So they they really um, helped with the Per Scholarship, and not and that that's actually sounds a bit too superficial, right? To say the Per Scholarship as if it was it's just a matter of of looking at uh, looking in the massive manuscript pile and saying, hey, you should read this. Uh, they really, really uh, were fantastic in deepening my understanding of what Purse really was. Uh, was all about. And, uh, and, and Wiggins, on the other hand, because he hadn't read a lot of Purse, and in fact, we, were, we started to read more Purse together, uh, you know, was, was really, um, I don't want to say the driver, but really guided me in terms of, of seeing not just what Purse was on about, but but where in Purse you found uh, real philosophical insight that one wanted to build on. They, they had very, very different styles. So in the, in the first term, uh, David Wiggins was off at Stanford at the Advanced Studies Institute. And so I actually spent the most of that first term with, uh, with Susan. And if you've read Susan's work, uh, you'll know that she she's really great at carving out the landscape. The and so she she thought I should do the same thing, set out the five different kinds of realism and the six different kinds of non-realism, and you know situate Purse and my view in this very complicated landscape, and it was really really good for me. To do that, I wrote a long first chapter where I, I did just that. You have five different kinds of realism, six different kinds of relativism. And then when David Wiggins came back from Stanford, he said, "Well, that 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 might be very useful, but you just must tear it up now, and uh, and start from you know the the core insight and and build from there." So my supervisory committee was a dream team but it wasn't without its tensions. So the, the style of David Wiggins and Susan Hack couldn't be more different. Wow. And, uh, and I wrote my paper more in the style of David Wiggins and Susan Hack. And actually Chris Hockway was more w Wigginsian than Hackian as well. So I would say I yeah, probably wrote my dissertation more in the style of Wiggins and, and Hockway. Well, that must be quite a challenge to get two very different um, well suggestions about how to approach a topic um, as you say that, that the hack versus Wiggins and then having to decide between them and yet yes. not, lose, not lose friends or you know loyalties or whatever given yeah. that they've all offered their their, their services yes. um, so so you you obviously finished your DPhil um, uh, and uh, but what's interesting also when you look at that time is you you also started teaching. I think you were you were in Balliol or you were based in Balliol at the time. How did you find the teaching at Oxford, which is well, it's peculiar to Oxford and Cambridge, this sort of one to one tutorial. It was a, for the first off, it was a real privilege to have uh, what I think was a nine hour lectureship there because at the time, not uh, all graduate students did teach, uh, it's probably still the case in Oxford that fewer graduate students teach than in North America. So it was, it was a great privilege. Um, I was teaching Hume, Descartes, introductory logic. Uh, it, was, it, it, it was a big stretch because I had, hadn't uh, gone through the PPE system. So it's, I was teaching philosophy, politics, and economics. Um, but it was it was fantastic. Uh, the one-on-one -on -one tutorials or the two-on-one -on -one tutorials you know, were a new thing for me, really interesting to teach. And then for the logic, actually, I um, uh, got the college, the whole college to uh, change their uh, tutorial methods a little bit. I, I was given these logic tutorials. And, the, uh, every hour, a new set of two students would come in, and every hour they would have the same difficulty with the same three problems. So 
all I did hour after hour was go over those three toughest uh, questions that they had been given uh, as their kind of weekly work. And it, it was ridiculous. We might as well just put a recorder on and hit record. <laughs> yeah. So Bill Newton Smith was uh, in charge of the philosophy PPE teaching. And and he he was a great logician. And I said to him, look, it's kind of mad to do this again and again. And he had had decades of experience of it. And he said, yeah, well, why don't we try having a having a class? So instead of uh, of two on one tutorials, hour after hour, uh, we had a longer class where we just spent more time going over those uh, three really difficult problems. And it worked, it worked very well. What were what were the what were the problems, by the way, in, in, that you're referring to? Well, you'd give you'd give the students a problem set. You'd ask them to formalize something or do a proof, and some of the proofs were easy, and and some of the formalizations were easy. But there would be th- you know two or three that would be really tough, and so of course those were the ones that needed discussing uh, every week. Okay. Did you have any? Um... Notable students when you were teaching there that you recall? It was an interesting year. <laughs> um, I, I actually just emailed uh, someone to say that I was really glad that I wasn't on the Balliol Admissions Committee when I admitted this uh, <laughs> lot of students. Um, so in, in the undergraduate community at the time uh, was Boris Johnson, uh, Ghislaine Maxwell, Cressida Dick, who is now head of the London Metropolitan Police. And uh, also, uh, I don't know if you recall this labor politician, uh, Stephen Twigg, he was, oh, yes. he was the one who, who took down Michael Portillo. And uh, so it was, it was an amazing, uh, an amazing uh, class. They, they weren't all doing PPE, but they were, you know, these, communi- these undergraduate communities in, a, in an Oxford college are very small. And so I had, uh, I had things, I had dealings with uh, Stephen Twigg, who I I taught, Um, uh, he was in PPE, with Boris Johnson, I gave some revision tutorials uh, to him when it looked like he wasn't going to do so well in the finals. Uh, Ghislaine Maxwell was on the Balliol Tennis Cuppers team with me and uh, Cressida Dick I knew not not so well, but it's just, it's it's, uh, astounding that in, you know, one intake, you could have four people who, uh, let's just put it this way, are so much in the news 30, 40 years later. Yes. Various <laughs> things. <laughs> when I was asking you, had your notable students, I didn't think they'd be that notable, <laughs> uh, especially as we speak. I mean, they couldn't be more notable, at least two of them anyway. Um, if not, uh, Cressida Dick, I've seen at the moment because of what's going on as well. But, um, that is fascinating because, and it's also Balliol is a is a college that tends to produce politicians, so you it has that tradition. So it was probably likely you were going to come across students that were set for Westminster, but maybe not even, but prime ministers as well. So that was a very interesting time. Yes. Um, especially given that you were focusing on things like truth. Yes. <laughs> uh, their their relationship with the truth is. Uh, hmm quite distant a lot of time as far as I can see. Um, great. So you finished your um, you finished your, your PhD and that PhD then became really your first book. Um, can you give us a sense of what that book and your PhD tried to do? Obviously, you, you revised it for publication. Mm-hmm. What was it saying about Pierce that hadn't been said? So Pierce's account of truth is often misunderstood Understandably, because Peirce wasn't very clear, but it's often misunderstood as follows. Uh, So let's take a step back. Uh, Peirce reacted against versions of the correspondence theory of truth, which say that a proposition is true if it corresponds to or hooks onto or mirrors the world of it independently existing objects. So if you think about Wittgenstein's Tractatus, the Vienna Circle, all these people had 
correspondent series of truth after Peirce, but the correspondent yeah. series of truth existed obviously before Peirce, and this is what he was reacting uh, against. And Peirce argued that that, that conception of truth is not one that we can actually employ in inquiry and deliberation. How could we aim for a truth that was completely independent of us, that was a matter of, of propositions hooking on to a completely believer independent set of objects? All we have access to is our perceptions, our inquiries. And so Peirce thought that it was much better it was required to develop an account of truth that says that truth is the very best that our inquiries could do. So truth, uh, he argued, or I argued that he argued, truth is what would be indefeasible, a belief that wouldn't be defeated by any evidence, by any further information we required, a belief that would stand up to anything that we could throw at it. Now, often Peirce's theory of truth is misread as, as uh, being as follows. Truth is that which is fated to be believed at the end of inquiry. And people have objected to it and they've said, well, well what if um, you know, an atomic bomb goes off and, the, and inquiry ends in that kind of way? Are all of the beliefs we happen to hold right now true? That seems completely wrong. And yes, it would be completely wrong. Uh, and my, uh, my contribution, if you like, in, in my thesis and in the subsequent book was to sh shift attention from the one time that Per said, truth is that which is fated to be believed at the end of inquiry, to the idea that a true belief is one that is indefeasible, wouldn't be defeated. Okay, now that's... Um... I mean, that's very interesting, uh, that distinction as well. Um, one of the, so let's talk about that for a second, because I think uh, it's worth, worth examining. Um, how does Pierce and those who believe that theory of the truth deal with the objection, for example, well, we can mistake what is indefeasible with dogmatism or, you know, just really fixed beliefs that are, are just merely fixed because people strongly believe them, but they may, may may well not be true. How does it deal with that kind of relativism or subjectivism or dogmatism, basically? Super question, and uh, and person in fact wrote a paper. Perhaps you, this is what you're referring to, called the fixation of belief, where he where he took on these very issues. It's a very hard paper to read, uh, like all of his <laughs> his his work. Um, but in that paper and in uh, other places as well, he argued that if we fix beliefs by dogmatism or by adopting a political system or a God, a religious system that just tells us what to believe, then we're adopting a method that uh, is not aimed at getting a true belief. It's not aimed at getting a belief that would be indefeasible. It's aimed at getting a belief that is just sticks, that is fixed. So if you want a belief that really would stand up to everything, every experience, then you had better adopt the method of experience, taking all experience seriously. Otherwise, you're not aiming at truth, you're aiming at something else. So one example that I use is that if a physicist uh, uh, adopted a method where she wasn't gonna take into account any results from Finland uh, or all the Scandinavian countries, that would be a very bad method to adopt. It wouldn't be aimed at getting the truth. It would be aimed at getting a belief, what, that everyone but the Finns <laughs> uh, holds? Because if you want the best theory of physics, you have to take the results of all the labs seriously. And this is uh, a theory of truth that also works for ethics. So if you want to find out what the right uh, ethical thing to do is, you had better listen to all the voices, all the experience, especially those that have not been listened to in the past. 
Well, for instance, uh, when you're thinking about human rights, and if you look at the history of human rights thought, it's often been by listening to what women have to say about the policies that uh, that uh, have, have they've lived under, or what uh, uh, non-binary binary gender uh, folks have to say about the policies that uh, affect them, that we actually change our our beliefs. So Peirce argued that the method that you have to adopt if you want to get the truth, if you want to get a belief that really would stand up to all the experience is something like the method of science, but I, it's the method of taking all experience seriously. So you get a nice um, justification of listening to the voices of others uh, and to the labs of others uh, in, this, uh, in this theory of truth. Does so that theory of truth then, now that pragmatist, maybe you want to call it, theory of truth from Pierce, does that, can that expect convergence or does it, or can it only expect a plurality of voices that truth can accommodate, but we can't expect convergence on a truth? So on some things, on some matters, we shouldn't expect convergence. So for instance, uh, many ethical matters are such that that an indefeasible belief won't be a determinate belief. It'll be a range of beliefs. So for instance, uh, you know, I have a thousand dollars that I want to give to charity. Uh, on, on one theory, on the extreme utilitarian theory, uh, and this is all the rage these days. I think it's a terrible, terrible view. There is a determinate answer. You have a thousand dollars, you give it to the mosquito net people because you will save more lives that way. And if, if I give my thousand dollars to uh, Oxfam, I, I, I've made a mistake. Or if I give my thousand dollars to uh, my struggling neighbor, I've made an even bigger mistake because my struggling neighbor is not in as much need as people without mosquito nets who are gonna die of malaria. So there's a theory, utilitarianism, that says there's a determinate answer to our moral questions, and it's a calculation. But you know, what's the most uh, utility you can get out of that donation? And utilitarianism pretends to cover the whole ground of, of ethics. Whereas on the pragmatist view, you, you might uh, say, well, there's a range of options that are perfectly permissible, right? So you, you listen to the experience of my neighbor and, and people who are, uh, who are benefiting from Oxfam and, and you listen to your own experience about what matters most to you, helping people locally or helping people globally. There's no one right answer, but there's a range of answers. There's also a range of answers that are wrong. So in giving my thousand dollars to the neo-Nazi party, and there are lots of them right now, I'm, I'm giving uh, my money to uh, a group that isn't listening to the experience of others. In fact, they're trying to silence the voices of others. And hence, that's not a morally okay thing to do. Okay. And so that's on the on the moral side of things, then we can have a level of indeterminacy, even though it's, it's bounded, as you say. Um, it's not, you know, just sort of laissez-faire subjectivism. Um, and, but then you you also kind of suggested that there are areas where you could expect convergence. Is that in science or or does it yeah. go that far? So we uh, should expect convergence about matters such as whether the earth is round or flat. And we believe there is a right answer to that question. And we believe that the right answer is that it's round. And we have a lot of evidence <laughs> to tell us that to show us that it's round. But of course, we don't have convergence on even that. The flatter society is uh, 
is thriving right now. Mind boggling, but it's thriving. Uh, you, you, you know, you can look at anti-vaxxers uh, in the same way. So on a lot of matters in which there is a determinate answer, we don't have convergence. We don't have everyone believing that the right answer is the right answer. Uh, so what we, we, we don't want to demand too much for a theory of truth. On no theory of truth will we get actual convergence. But we can say with respect to matters such as whether the earth is flat or round, that there is an answer and we know what it is, it's round. Not everyone uh, believes it, but they haven't taken all the experience and evidence seriously. Okay. People who think that COVID is, uh, you know, is a hoax, uh, you know, some of them believe it even gasping from their last breaths uh, in the ICU, um, dying of COVID, but that doesn't, <laughs> the fact that there's not convergence on it does not mean that COVID is an actual deadly infectious disease. Okay, that's interesting. It's one thing that's puzzles me about the distinction between, say, for example, the pragmatist view of truth and the correspondence theory of truth. Um, because I can, I think I can understand where the pragmatist theory of truth plays out in the world of morality, that you've got this indeterminate yet bounded conception, so that we can say, for example, uh, Nazis are bad, and anti-Nazis are usually good. And we can make those sort of distinctions. It's not all subjective or nihilistic. But when we look at science, um, there I find it difficult to distinguish between the pragmatist theory of truth and say the correspondence of theory of truth in terms of ideal under ideal circumstances. So, you know, people are actually believing what they should believe, that the earth is spherical, it's not flat. There, I don't see what the difference is. Can you maybe explain where there is a difference there? So the, co the correspondence theory has a hard time saying the kinds of things that I just said about the flat earther, right? Uh, that the problem with the flat earther is that she hasn't taken all the evidence into account uh, and she hasn't taken it in, into account in the right ways. On the correspondence theory, if your proposition, the earth is round, corresponds to something that, uh, that it needn't be uh, linked to the evidence. It corresponds to a fact that it exists in the world. And the correspondence theorist has a hard time in saying why evidence for that fact is what we should be looking at, right? The correspondence theorist uh, has a divide, if you like, uh, between our beliefs and facts that needs to be bridged by evidence, experience, argument, but, but doesn't have the wherewithal to, to build that bridge because the very nature of the correspondence theory says that is that those facts are completely independent of us. Whereas the pragmatist theory says a true belief is one which would stand up to all of the evidence and argument and experience we could have. So it's in some sense, uh, relative to human beings, that's not the right word. It's truth is a concept that we human beings have, right? And, and so the pragmatist has no problem at all saying, and what we have uh, uh, to justify true beliefs or not is experience, evidence, argument. That's what we human beings, beings do when we inquire and deliberate. Mm, okay, that's very that's very helpful now, the way you've spelled it out there. In a way, actually, pragmatism it goes back to Kant, that we have all truths still have to be mind-dependent truths. They can't, the idea of a mind-independent world, why we can conceive of it, we can't really talk about it. Uh, because the minute we talk about it, we start contradicting ourselves because we're talking about this mind-independent world, which of course, leads to all sorts of logical uh, paradoxes and contradictions. I mean, before, maybe my last question on this is, do you think that the pragmatists really saw Kant more, they're really re reasserting Kant in a different way, in a way that the correspondence theory of truth forgot about? Yes, that's an excellent question. 
and, and I have an ongoing running debate with my uh, wonderful colleague, Arthur Ripstein, who's one of the finest camp scholars in the world about this. So, so two of the greatest pragmatists, C.S. Peirce and C.I. Lewis were uh, Kantians. Peirce had the critique of pure reason memorized in both editions. And Peirce argued that what he really was doing was naturalizing Kant. So uh, uh, just to add to what you said uh, uh, there about uh, pragmatism and Kant, Peirce wants to say that, look, we have regulative assumptions, assumptions such as there is a world about which we are inquiring and we can't know that that assumption is true, but we have to act on it if we're to do anything, to inquire, to walk out of the room, to do anything. Kant elevated those regulative assumptions, and that's of course Kant's phrase, to a transcendental truth. And Per says, it's not a transcendental truth. It's not necessarily true. It's just something we need to assume. So we will assume it, but we, uh, it's just trying to magic it into the truth the way Kant does is just not on. That's the okay. difference between person and Kant. Okay, very good. I, um, so I, th I think that discussion has been really helpful and actually explains why you have found pragmatism such a persistent interest of yours, you know, really throughout your career. Um, and if we go back now to, you know, you, you finished at Oxford, you obviously published that book, uh, which was critically acclaimed. And then you leave Oxford and you go back to Canada uh, and you your initial job is at uh, Queen's University, yeah, I think in Ontario, and then you go from there to what becomes your, your home, University of Toronto. Um, can you explain, first of all, how, how it was coming back to Canada and how you found those initial years? By this time, uh, I was married uh, to a South African who was committed to going back to South Africa. He was very politically engaged and actually he had a job in the law school at uh, the University of Pittsburgh. And so we had, a, we had a tough decision to make about whether to go to South Africa or to go to Canada. And at the time, 1988, South Africa was it just absurdly locked into just a really bad, patch in its sorry history of apartheid. It just looked as if nothing was ever going to change somehow <laughs> against all reason and all morality. It just, it just looked like it was going on and on and on apartheid. Um, but we, we actually explored, we had both had uh, opportunities there. And in the end, we decided to, uh, to come to Canada. Um, and we were a two-body problem, obviously. I had a job at Queen's and uh, my husband didn't. And so we were kind of still on the market. And then we both got jobs at the University of Toronto and, and moved there. Ah, I see. Okay. So that was the reason for the move. Did you meet your husband at Oxford or? I did, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, was he a Rhodes Scholar as well then, along with you, or was he? No, no. Okay, um, so he got a, so what did he, what did he end up uh, teaching uh, law? He taught law at University of Toronto. But all of his degrees are in law, uh, but they're in philosophy of law. So uh, Ronnie Dworkin was his supervisor at Oxford, and he wrote uh, a, a thesis and then a book called "Hard Cases in Wicked Legal Systems," uh, mostly on apartheid South Africa and the role of judges and lawyers within that system, how they could, uh, if, if was it possible to be a judge or a lawyer in a wicked legal system and still do the right thing? Was that, a, was that an option uh, for judges and lawyers? And he argued that yes, there was there's something about law and the rule of law, that even if you're in a, a, t a wicked legal system, such as apartheid South Africa or Weimar Germany, uh, you can get something out of the law and, and, and do your part in trying to make things better. Um, uh, so he now has a position half in the philosophy department, half in the law school at the University of Toronto. Okay, very good. Uh, did you meet Ronald Dwork when you were in Oxford with your husband during those years? I didn't know him very well, but I, I met him, yes. 
Okay. So, um, so, so you, you, both of you obviously get this job, and well, both of you get a job each in the University of, Chicago, of uh, Toronto, uh, and then, as I say, your career really starts taking off. You, you kind of scale the academic ladder with uh, great speed, and you become very prolific. Um, were you? Did you feel you were finding your philosophical feet really? Then, did you feel you were? You know, there was no looking back. This was now I'm, I'm made and I, I see a kind of a, a philosophical future here. Or were you still a lot of doubts? <laughs> Once you have a tenure track job, <laughs> your your life um, gets much easier and you you can pursue the projects that you are passionate about. So yes, in, in that way, we were both uh, then you know, kind of freed to pursue the academic projects that we were passionate about. Okay, and were those were those projects uh, mainly for you uh, in pragmatism, or were you in all of its various forms, or were you looking at other things as well? My my work has always stuck one way or another, pretty close to pragmatism. So what I did in the years. Uh, uh, the first years in Canada was I wrote the last chapter of my thesis. <laughs> so I had thought that I, the last chapter of my thesis was going to be on how the pragmatist account of truth was really suitable for moral and political judgments in the way that we've been uh, discussing. And David Wiggins laughed at me and he said, look, that's, that's a separate, uh, separate project. You can't, uh, you can't do that. Uh, uh, as well as you know, try to get Prince's account of the truth right. So I I uh, I spent the next six or seven years uh, writing a book called Truth Pre uh, Truth Politics Morality. I think it's called Pragmatism and Deliberation, and that was that was this application of the pragmatist account of truth to moral and political judgments. But even when I work on, so I I do quite a bit of work in philosophy of medicine. And uh, you know, pragmatism isn't front and center there, but it's in the background, because I think that you know, when you work in philosophy of medicine, you have to think hard about what experience is, what evidence is. These are the kinds of uh, topics that I've worked on in in that field. And as I say, pragmatism is in the background so much so uh, that once I was on a one of the big international guideline and policy setting committees that I uh, have been on. This was on medically futile and inappropriate treatment. Uh, at the end of this long, long process where there are you know, 40 people who are trying to hammer this out all over the world, uh, two uh, of the medics um, uh, said to me, look, we, when you were talking, you know, we kind of, figured that there was some theoretical framework in the background and we Googled you and we're, you know, we saw that it was just pragmatism. That's really interesting. Why don't we write a paper together about the, the pragmatist theoretical underpinnings of this very you know, medicine policy document that we've just written. And so we, we did that and uh, published a, a short version of it in a medical journal called Chest and a long version in medicine and philosophy, just showing how pragmatism actually really works well in an inquiry like this one, where it was, you know, as I say, it was, it was physicians, nurses, uh, uh, and one bioethicist and, and me, you know, trying to figure out what, what the right policy was when f the physicians think that it's futile to keep per a person on life support, mm -hmm. but the family, say, thinks that the person ought to be kept on life support. It, it's interesting when you're talking here generally about you know applying pragmatism to moral and political questions, like you've just said there, very in a very practical way. It it feels like you're you're kind of you're it's kind of new territory. I mean, because if you look at the history of pragmatism, it kind of in the 20th century, in a fairly varied history, it kind of ended in a way with Dewey and then become, became forgotten about for many, many years in terms of a fashionable thing to be studying. Because you had 
people like Quine dominating the world and then you had a lot analytic political philosophy really which had nothing to do and moral philosophy nothing to do with pragmatism so it sounds like you were kind of rediscovering it and then reapplying it and also realigning it with uh that analytic philosophy that looked like it had nothing to do with pragmatism but my argument is that it uh, it had a lot to do with pragmatism. So, so Russell was tempted by pragmatism. Quine was a kind of pragmatist. And then, you know, one of the, the great heroes of analytic philosophy, Frank Ramsey, was a card-carrying pragmatist. And uh, I've been really trying to, to debunk the myth that analytic philosophy and pragmatism don't mix. I think it's just, it's just false. And uh, so a big part of my work in the last decade, has, perhaps the last 15 years, has been to, to try to show that a lot of the, the greatest analytic philosophers saw the insights in pragmatism, either toyed with them the way Russell did, and then thought, nah, I'm not going there, or completely adopted them like Ramsey did. Okay, that's interesting, because you've also mentioned um that you're looking at other analytic philosophers like Ryle and Austin, who were kind of pragmatist in everything but name. Um, uh, have you got firm views about how they showed their pragmatism or is that still a work in, under investigation? It's still very much a work uh, in progress, but I can see the lines <laughs> of influence forming really, really uh, clearly. So uh, I, I've been in Ryle's papers in Oxford and Ryle had Persis collected papers. He annotated them in exactly the places that you might expect. Uh, he had Ramsey's posthumously published papers. Ramsey died at the age of 26. And he clearly picked up a lot of direct things, uh, things directly from Ramsey. So Ryle's you know, dispositional account of uh, of the mind and beliefs come right out of Ramsey and, and Peirce. Uh, so there's, there's, there's a, a lot. This, uh, Austin and Asai Berlin held the first class in Oxford that was on a contemporary philosopher on C.I. Lewis's Mind in the World Order in 1929. Um, they knew that book inside and out. And uh, and so I'm I'm drawing these uh, these connections now, but it's it's I'm right at the beginning of the of the process. That's that's fascinating because one of the things I'm working on at the moment is what I see where you see pragmatism, I see a kind of an implicit Kanti Kantianism, uh, especially in the work. Well, explicitly in the work of of Berlin. Uh, I'm talking about Kantianism in an epistemological sense, not in a moral sense. And also, I think it's it's very much there in the work of Hart and his idea of human rights, which I think goes back almost to a kind of a transcendental argument or derivation of human rights, uh, because that isn't that's very that's very thinly connected with positivism uh, in that kind of sense. So uh, that is interesting. Uh, sometimes I think I've got things completely wrong. It's eccentric, so it's it's reassuring to see that I may not be entirely wrong about my uh, my conjecture there. Um, that's um, well I mean I was going to actually but I think we might just stay on this topic a little longer now uh, because it's such a rich topic um, not just independently but obviously the way you've looked at it and I'd like now maybe to move to your to your book on, on Ramsey um, because that is your last publication it's a major publication it's been a book that's been widely um, reviewed and acclaimed um, so I'd like to begin, if we spend a bit of time now on this, talking about Ramsey, um, and if we start maybe with, you know, why you wanted to study Ramsey in the first place, and then we'll, we'll work from there. Ramsey was the philosophical hero of my previous book uh, called Cambridge Pragmatism, where I was showing why the philosophers in Cambridge, England had such clear and identifiable pragmatist uh, tendencies. And actually, Hugh Price had uh, got me started on this. So Hugh had a conference in 2012 called Cambridge Pragmatism about this very fact, 
Cambridge, England, University of Cambridge has produced a lot of pragmatist philosophers, Hugh, Simon Blackburn, uh, you know, Hugh Miller, uh, um, all sorts of, uh, of people in the generation before them. Why, why is this? And, and Hugh asked me to give the in introductory historical talk. And then the rest of the conference was on, you know, kind of more contemporary uh, Cambridge pragmatism. And at the time I had this big job, I was provost at the University of Toronto. And I knew as everyone who works on pragmatism knows that Frank Ramsey called himself a pragmatist, but it seems so out of character because he's famous for, uh, for a lot of very technical uh, results. And uh, I jumped into it and was overexcited in this, in this talk that I gave because it was just obvious that it was, you know, Ramsey was indeed a pragmatist and he was the one who really cemented pragmatism in Cambridge, England. And uh, so I wrote a book uh, about this, Ramsey and Wittgenstein, and then how philosophy in Cambridge uh, evolved. And I was a, a visiting fellow at Trinity College, Cambridge. And after lunch one day, Marcia Sen uh, and I were chatting and Marcia had just uh, written a wonderful piece on Keynes and Srafa and Ramsey. And I said, it's a fantastic, lovely piece. And, and we were talking about uh, my work and he suggested that I, uh, that I write a biography of Ramsey. And so that's how it came about. And at first I said, no, that's crazy. Uh, because Ramsey, uh, as you may know, was not just a hugely successful uh, technical philosopher, but he also was just as important in economics and also just as technical. And there's a branch of pure combinatoric mathematics named after him, Ramsey theory. So my view is no one can write a, an intellectual biography of Ramsey unless you're Ramsey himself, because no one can master all of these, uh, these uh, areas. And uh, Amartya said, well, but if you don't do it, who's going to, you know, you've just, you know, you, you're, you're in, you're deep into Ramsey and a biography needs to be written. And if you don't do it, you know, who's going to do it? So I, I leapt into it. <laughs> Well, congratulations. Yeah, you're right. He's the kind of the polymath, polymath, really, isn't he? I mean, it's, it's not just the width, it's the depth of his knowledge, which is staggering. Um, having read the book, uh, which I very much enjoyed, um, I mean, how did you, I mean, because, you know, it's one thing to write about ideas, but in that book, that was your first book, as far as I know, that was a biography, it was an intellectual biography. Uh, like, how did you go about that? I mean, did you go get advice from people who had, like Ray Monk, for example, or did you just plow your own field? I, pl I plowed my own field. My, his my friends in history thought that I was, uh, that I adopted a very strange methodology. So I, 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 I had been in the archives already for the previous book, because if you really wanted to figure out uh, what Ramsey was on about, like you, you had to, you had to get into the archives he died at the age of 26 uh, with a book manuscript uh, half finished, uh, only only kind of published in draft in 1991. And I think this is one of the reasons that a lot of philosophers have, have kind of not seen how much of a pragmatist uh, he really was. So I had been in the archives to write the previous book. And what I did is I just took my laptop and I I... Kind of, kind of wrote as I went along, Just always being careful to cite, you know, the, the folder in the archive that I was getting a, a thought out of. And that's not the way historians work. They go into the archive with index cards or their computer and they, they take years and years of notes and uh, they they just couldn't understand how I was going into the archive with my manuscript and writing as I went along. So I, I didn't take advice, um, um, but I, in, in effect, took careful notes in this unusual way. And, uh, and I, I loved writing it. It was very, very um, interesting to try to get into someone's character 
and uh, and and at the end, I really thought that I I had a, had some proper understanding of Ramsey's character, and then tried to convey that in the book. To people who haven't read the book, um, to give them a kind of a sense of the person that was Ramsey, can you describe who he was? He he, he was a very large untidy, funny, sim simple in, in that he, what, he wasn't kind of, he wasn't manipulative. He was very, very straightforward uh, and very, very much loved by uh, everyone who knew him after he left Winchester boarding school. He was bullied at school because he was so clever and kind of gangly and awkward. Uh, but as soon as he hit uh, uh, Trinity College, Cambridge, everyone saw that he was a very special mind, but also a very special character. And uh, he was kind of without guile uh, and, and hence uh, loved by, by all, I think. There were three things that really jumped out at me when I read your book. Um, the first one was um, when he said he had a week, he had a couple of days. I think he had three days off. He thought he saw three days of, and he said, I think I'll write what I have to write in those three days or I'll get most of it done. So he seemed to see what, what the rest of us would need at least three years. He saw he could do in three days. That was the first thing that was just jumped out. And then I wondered, you know, when I was reading that, did he did he have a feeling he was going to die young because he time was so precious? And I mean, that would be just he obviously didn't because when he said that he wasn't that sort. The the second thing then was um, that really impressed me um, was, and you mentioned this towards the end of the of your biography, where he realised that he was about to write his book on philosophy, and he says, "But the the difficulty I'm having is that it's all connected." And um, that I'm very, very sympathetic to that view that philosophy is necessarily connected. And the tragedy of philosophy in the last, I think, in the last 50, 70 years, maybe the last 100 years, is that we've ceased to be seeing it as connected. It's got specialized to a chronic and terrible degree. Uh, by, I think we're almost murdering the subject. And he he saw that that early. Well, he couldn't do that. Well, but he, he was on his way to doing it. And it's it's especially tragic uh, when you think of how philosophy has become so hyper specialized. To see that Ramsey is actually someone that that hyper specialized philosophers have picked out some little technical thing in Ramsey here and there, Ramsey sentences, Ramsey conditionalization, and as if they were completely unconnected to the rest of his work. Whereas Ramsey saw that it was all connected. And I think people you know, got Ramsey sentences wrong as a result uh, because they didn't see that it was connected with his pragmatist approach. And uh, he, he was pulling it all together. So I really try both in Cambridge pragmatism and in the Ramsey biography to show where Ramsey was going in building himself a, a really kind of uh, a system of philosophy. It's not that you can just find these little technical gems in Ramsey and pull them out and treat them as if they don't exist in a wider context. Um, what was it when you were, when you were researching and writing that book, what, was there any moments where you said, oh, that is, I never expected that, or that's a massive discovery? Yes. Uh, so, so for instance, when I dived into his economics, and I got, and you know, I got a lot of help from a lot of people in figuring out, uh, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, what, what was going on in in these various uh, domains, uh, but. Um, it looks as if his two famous papers in economics, which were about optimal savings theory and optimal taxation theory, and they were so famous that when 
Keynes's, the, the journal that Keynes is so associated with, the economic journal, when they had their 125th anniversary, they brought out a volume of their 13 greatest hits in 125 years, one of the best journals of economics. And both Ramsey's papers were included in these 13. And the editors had to explain in the preface, because I'm sure there were lots of disappointed people out there, why uh, in their 13 greatest hits in 125 years, they had two papers by one person. And they said, each of these papers sparked an entire sub-branch of economic, we had to include them. But uh, these papers look like they are straight up utilitarian uh, analyses of taxation and savings. And one of the discoveries that I had, one of the kind of aha moments, and I was, I was helped by you know, reading really good economists on Ramsey, was that Ramsey wasn't actually uh, offering us, he didn't think that what economics should be doing is finding the solution that maximizes utility. He was aiming for um, a realistic, what's sometimes called second best solution in economics, where you get the best solution for human beings that you can. And he thought that, uh, that, that rational choice uh, and utility analyses which he was uh, he was brilliant at, and in, in fact, figured out how to axiomatize choice. He was the first before Definetti by about a year. Um, he thought these were idealizations that we shouldn't think, uh, you know, are are getting things right. <laughs> they're they're for ideal creatures, not creatures like uh, like us. So when when I saw that his work in economics actually. Uh, you know, fit into his general pragmatist approach. That was an aha moment. Okay, very interesting. Um, on, on a personal level, did you, was there anything that came out of his life, independently of his ideas, that was that surprised you? Or well, I didn't. I didn't know uh, the much in depth about his personal life. So there were surprises around every corner, uh, just how, so he, he was marked out as brilliant from very, very early on. And yet, uh, you know, he, like everyone else, had absolutely major crises of confidence, thought his work was no good, thought he was useless. You know, the, just someone who is uh, so clearly above and beyond you know the the rest of us uh, had had the same kind of feelings of uh, intellectual insecurity as as anyone else. That that was um, that was a surprise mm. uh, and a nice surprise, right? Um, so he was yeah. modest and he didn't think that he was so brilliant. Uh, he could see that he was good, but he he didn't walk around thinking that he was better than everyone else when he. So obviously was. <laughs> it's um, I mean, obviously people knew about Ramsey before he wrote your book. I mean, he wasn't completely obscure. I mean, there was, uh, but reading your book and seeing the amount of um coverage it's getting, and even after I suppose when Hugh Mellor produced those essays as well, many years ago, well, not many years ago, but before, do you think that Ramsey's time is yet to come? In other words, that we really are only beginning to appreciate his significance. And where do you see that going, if that's the case? Yeah. So in philosophy, I think that that is true, although it sounds absurd, right? Because he is one of the... Um, He's, he's one of the stars in the firmament in philosophy. But I do think that in philosophy, we haven't uh, understood the depth of his work because we haven't fully understood that he's probably the best pragmatist uh, ever. In mathematics and economics though, uh, you know, he's, uh, you know, 
there'll be two Ramsey theorists in any good department of mathematics. I mean, my work is not going to uh, elevate his, um, his status or change mathematicians' perception of Ramsey. Right? Um, so I think it's just in philosophy that uh, I think we still have, you know, we have some work to do in coming to grips with him. But in economics and mathematics, you know, he's, he's already, uh, you know, pretty well understood. In economics, I th so I've just published a paper with an econ a Brazilian economist, um, Pedro Garcia Duarte, uh, titled Frank Ramsey's Place in the History of Mathematics, Not What You Think. Um, and that's in, in, in a uh, history of economics journal. And so I think there is a little bit of work to do in kind of rethinking re Ramsey's place in the history of economics. But as far as like straight up economics goes, you know, as I say, he's, uh, he's discussed in first year graduate classes and, you know, he's already, he's well ensconced. Hmm. But, well, when you say philosophy, that that's where hopefully he, we will see his, his reputation rise. Um, is it, it, it does strike me that if his reputation does rise and his influence increases, that that will in many ways, I think, be antithetical to where philosophy finds itself today. So there will probably be a fair bit of resistance because the hyper, the hyper specialists, will, they will not necessarily want to accommodate a more holistic view of, of philosophy, which Ramsey, I think, uh, favors, even though you could interpret that he was kind of almost a proto, uh, he was starting off certain hyper specializations. Yeah, I would put, I would put the resistance in a slightly different way, just because I felt it. <laughs> I felt where it is. Uh, so initially, um, when I first started giving talks in philosophy departments about Ramsey's pragmatism, I had people put up their hands and say, that's mad. Someone as smart and technically sophisticated and absolutely gobsmackingly brilliant like Frank Ramsey could not have been a pragmatist. And, you know, I just go back to the PowerPoint and I put the quotes up again and again and again. I had a lot of resistance and downright hostility uh, in some talks, but it was of the sort, it, it's too stupid of you for someone as great as Frank Ramsey to hold. And, and then that stopped um, just because uh, he, did, he did hold it. <laughs> and it's, it's, not, uh, it's not deniable really. And uh, I'm hoping that, that people see, so some people who were dead set against pragmatism see that if someone, if one of their heroes like Ramsey thought that this was the way to go, that pragmatism actually will get uh, more of a hearing as well. Ah, okay. That's <laughs> so you, the, the resistance comes from Ram, so-called Ramsey scholars as opposed to non-Ramsey. Okay, interesting. Um, so in that regard, do you see your book as a kind of uh, unconventional uh, interpretation of Ramsey uh, compared to the orthodox view or and who are these orthodox scholars? I, you don't need to name names, but where are they ho hanging out? Well, so just take Ramsey sentences, for instance. Uh, so a Ramsey, there's a problem in, in analytic philosophy of science. It goes back to Wittgenstein's Tractatus, the Vienna Circle, um, uh, and farther back. It goes back to Mach, at least. If, uh, if you're... Uh, if your theory, your philosophical theory, says that um, that uh, a proposition is true if it hooks onto objects in reality, uh, and the way that we can tell whether your proposition hooks up to objects in reality is that we observe uh, what's going on in the world, what happens to all those parts of science, such as general propositions, all arsenic is poisonous. You don't, you don't observe every sample of arsenic and its effect on organisms. Uh, what happens to unobservable 
entities in physics that are too, you know, you're inferring from uh, various experimental setups. This has been a big problem uh, for this, this kind of philosophy of science. And a, a lot of people think that Ramsey was trying to solve that problem for the correspondence theorist in a paper that he wrote just before he died called Theories. I'm sure it was meant to be part of the book. And it was one of a bunch of drafts of papers. And in fact, the actual manuscript has gone missing. Can't find it. It's one of the few papers of theory, uh, papers of Ramsey's where we've got the, you know, the text, but the manuscript is missing. Uh, and uh, it would be really good to get one's hands on it. Um, but it, uh, it's really, it's a draft, it's complicated, and you have to read it really carefully a hundred times before you see what he means when he says, so what he's trying to do is he's trying to give, he's offering a hand to his people like Carnap and Russell, who he says, think that we have to be able to uh, translate uh, a, a sentence uh, about ex experience into a physical language. So he's actually saying, okay, here's a way of doing it. I think it's the wrong way. And then he, you know, he's gonna give you the right way. So uh, it's people who picked up Ramsey sentences and, and taken them to be a part of the say Carnapian project who are, who just can't believe <laughs> that my, you know, uh, my account of Ramsey is, no, 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 he wasn't doing that. Look, he says, uh, I, I'm going to show this because Carnap, Russell, and others suppose that we have to be able to do this. So he's just like, he's offering them a helping hand. And okay. if you really want to, if you really want to figure out what Ramsey sentences are, you have to think about the whole of his system. Yeah, that is interesting. It's kind of like negative truth, isn't it? Like, I didn't go for a walk this morning. How do you, <laughs> how do you, how do you accommodate? It's still a yeah. fact, but it's not a, it's not a physical fact. Um, okay, well, look, thanks, Cheryl, for that. I found that very interesting. And I'd like now maybe just to change focus a little bit. I, because I would like to talk about, or you to talk about your your kind of parallel career, which has been in administration. Uh, you have, and you've you've indicated a little bit so far when you were provost, but uh, I'd like to discuss that for a while now. And, uh, you know, how, why you got, why you went into administration. A lot of academics don't, they stick to their, well, maybe their knitting and they, they do that. You went into administration, you know, I think in the late eighties or late, sorry, late nineties. And you've, you ultimately became provost of the university of Toronto. Um, why did, first of all, why did you go into that? Why did you? I, I didn't intend to. It wasn't something uh, that I wanted to do or was aiming at, uh, at doing. Uh, so I, I became chair of the philosophy department at a fairly young age. Uh, I don't, I don't know why, but I, you know, I, I was chair of the philosophy department because I cared about the the place and uh, and it's it's an extremely good department. The, philosophy department at the University of Toronto, all sorts of reasons to care about its well-being. And then it was just kind of accidental. Uh, one of our campuses was going to have its first ever dean and they were going to, uh, they were going to demarcate from amorphous categories of science, social science and humanities. They were going to demarcate departments and uh, I was asked to be the first dean and do that job. And I cared about, I actually started on that campus and I cared about how that demarcation was going to go. You know, was it gonna be a department of philosophy, religion and history or, or was it gonna be a department of philosophy? So I, I went out and I did that job. Uh, and in I think my third year, the head of that campus, who's the vice president of the university, went on leave and I filled in for him. And I, I really liked the, the, the range of uh, problems to be solved and things to be done from, you know, putting up buildings to legal arguments with uh, evil software companies. And I, you know, I found that I really enjoyed it. And, and then, you know, I was brought into central administration and all the while I kept saying, look, I'm, 
I'm only doing this temporarily. Uh, and uh, in fact, that was a kind of classic sucker punch that I ended up being provost. I was asked by the then provost if I would be a vice provost. And I said, no, I'm, I'm going back to uh, philosophy. Uh, this is when I was at this other campus. And he said, well, how about if uh, we make you deputy provost for just a year and you, you're always saying that, you know, we should do this and we should change this. And you just be, there had been no deputy provost position. We're just gonna make this position, your deputy provost, and you just can do these things that you think are important. So it was an offer uh, too good to turn down one year, you know, get these, these important things done. And so I said, okay, sure, I'll do that. And then a few months later, uh, the provost, uh, uh, announced that he was going off to be the head of our equivalent of the Center for Disease Control. So he already knew it at the time, um, but of course it was a big government position and no one else could know it. So I was literally, if, it turns out if you're a deputy provost with no portfolio and the provost leaves uh, you know, in a few weeks, you become interim provost, of course. <laughs> so as I say, it was, it, was, uh, it was a sucker punch. I fell for it, but I, I loved it. Um, it was really, really uh, important work. You know, I, I hate it when academics uh, denigrate the people who are really trying to, you know, run their universities and run them well. The jobs are unbelievably difficult. You don't sleep. Uh, you're up in the middle of the night because of crises or negotiations and if you do sleep you don't understand the you know the importance of the of the stuff that is uh you know barreling down at you um so it's you know they're tough jobs i really wish academics would not call the people who are running universities managers they're not they're not managing things if they're doing a good job they're really really uh working on behalf of everyone. You know, maybe they get things wrong, but um, I, have, I have a lot of respect for people who do these jobs. It's interesting you, you, your, your approach there. I mean, I mean uh, back one of the things I was thinking about when I look at your career, you, I, I initially thought, she might, well, Cheryl must be a very ambitious person because you know, she's head of a department, she's a university professor, she was provost. But what emerges is it's not so much that you're ambitious, you just, I mean, you kind of indicated there at the first bit, you, you, you were afraid of, well, if I don't do this, someone else could make a really hash of it in terms of the demarcation problem. And I have a view about that. And then when you said, when someone said, well, a Martin said, said, well, why don't you write the book? And you never occurred to you. And then he says, well, who else is going to do it? And then that kind of inspires you to do it. So it was negative. It's a kind of a negative uh, motivation as opposed to, oh, I want to run a university. Um, but let me let me ask my next question this way. If um, if I was going to a meeting that you were about to chair, uh, say, provost of the university, and I asked one of the people going there that knew you how you operate, how would they describe you if I, if I said, well, who is this Cheryl? What, how's the meeting going to go? Well, you know, you would have to ask someone else right? because you're just going to get my my view. So, so I tried to be deliberative. Uh, I, you know, I tried to have uh, have an outcome that was uh, really carefully d discussed and debated. Uh, that was my approach. Not everyone liked it, though, because it, you know, it turns out that, you know, if you're, you're meeting all the deans and there's some, uh, you know, it's always some major issue that uh, you have to discuss and decide upon. My view is, my approach was always to not say, we're doing this. It was to say, here's the problem here are the, the two or three things that we could do, you know, let's, let's discuss it. But then of course, when you're discussing it, sometimes you're gonna say, again, you're running the meeting. Sometimes you're gonna say, ah, oh, yeah, great. That's an excellent thought. And sometimes you're not gonna say that. And it turns out that, uh, you know, people don't always like that approach. <laughs> so okay. I actually, I had to, um, 
after the first year of being provost, I had to, in response to feedback, become a little less deliberative, which really went against the, my grain. Uh, but it was clear that that's what, you know, the deans uh, prefer it a little bit more, um, just non-deliberative decision-making, which sounds really counterintuitive, right? But, um, but there you have it. Okay. Uh, well, the, the reason I, because I, I, I do find this area fascinating, because I mean, I, I, I've been working in the corporate world for the last 25 years, and I work in communications, which you don't have to be very senior in a company to be working at a very senior level, because that's where we operate. But one of the things I've often discovered is when you, if, when a big decision is to be made at a corporate, at a board meeting or a senior executive meeting, that the decision is usually made before. So I would be spending a lot of my time, if it was my decision or my proposal, I would have tried to have ironed out all the issues before we even went into the meeting, not leaving it to chance at the meeting. Um, and I'm just wondering, the deliberative approach, you could play with that a little bit, but, you know, it's it's a very open-ended approach. Yeah, so for sure, uh, I went into meetings having a view about what the best outcome was. You're in dereliction of duty if you just walk into a meeting and, and you know, let, uh, <laughs> let, the, let, let the chips fall where they, where they may. So for certain, uh, I, I always had a view about where I thought we should go. But, you know, being a pragmatist and a fallibilist, uh, I believe in fallibilism, not all your beliefs are, uh, are certainly true. You know, I, I always went in with an open mind, prepared to be... Uh, prepared to be shifted off my view. Okay. Uh, two other questions I'd like to ask on this side of your life. Uh, one is, you know, how you found being a woman in these very senior roles. Um, I don't want to raise that as an issue if it's not an issue, if it's not a theme, so you don't have to make any more of that if it's not the case. And then the second area I'd like to ask you about is your training as a philosopher and how that has helped you be a, a successful administrator. Yeah, so I think we've probably discussed the the uh, philosophy and administration <laughs> position. If if anything, uh, I had to pull back a little bit on the philosophical methodology about you know giving and asking for reasons and uh, um, be a little bit um, less philosophical uh, in my administrative life. Uh, in terms of being a woman, you know, I I I didn't. I didn't myself feel any issues in uh, being provost of a very large university and and uh, and being a woman. I mean, obviously, there's some superficial things like you know, men can have three suits, and and no one ever notices that they you know they only oh, have yeah. women. Oh my God, you've got to spend a lot of money on clothing, <laughs> right? Um, those are utter, those are utterly superficial. Uh, yeah. uh, features of, uh, of, of that kind of world. Um, but I, I just, I didn't find any, any, any deep uh, issues in being a woman in that position. Okay. I mean, I suppose what, what I'm supposed to trying to get at is being a woman, do you think that you make decisions differently or do you have a different approach than the typical male approach, which you were, you were hinting that, you know, you have to get very decisive about certain things. You you have to dirty your hands, as they sometimes say in politics. It's it's almost inescapable. Um, and I wonder, did those things become, did you find that more challenging or did you feel you found that more challenging than the typical male executive does? So I, I, don't, I don't know about the typical male executive, but certainly, you know, in in the the team that we had uh, there were more men than women and i didn't notice that uh, i had more of a challenge with respect to the kinds of you know really uh serious challenges you mentioned than than the men you know difficult things are difficult for everyone and uh as I say, I, I, I didn't notice, at least in the group of people who were running the University of Toronto then, that uh, 
that you know I, I was disadvantaged in in being a woman coming to these these challenges and and look if if you can't cope with uh, this sort of challenge uh, you shouldn't be in these jobs mm-hmm. and that's why I say that you know if, if you're not up in the middle of the night uh, you know you, you're not uh, understanding the the kind of uh, difficulty of the problems that are coming your way. <laughs> um, just going back now, we're kind of going to start concluding our, our, our discussion, but um, you've indicated that, you know, you're now looking, uh, going, looking at going back to Oxford to do research on your new book, where you see this kind of pragmatism implicit in the uh, Oxford tradition of the 20th century. Um, so is that going to be basically taking up most of your time now? Uh, in the immediate future? I, I, it'll be taking up a lot of my time. I, I also, I think I'm going to jump into some big philosophy medicine projects uh, as well. I'd like to be working on a few things at, at once. Okay. Um, well, I'd like to finish this interview, uh, Cheryl, if I may, by asking uh, a kind of a Desert Island Discs kind of, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that BBC program, uh, but it, they tend to end with asking the, the guest, um, you know, if you if you did end up going to a desert island, uh, what book, uh, record, uh, and luxury you bring with you? Uh, book record and and, and what? luxury. Luxury. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, the luxury would be some kind of exercise equipment, I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the uh, the music um, would be, you know, some kind. Um, this is going to sound very superficial, but you know, so we talked about Joni Mitchell earlier. Uh, it, it's not that I think I would choose Joni Mitchell, but you know, maybe some Guy Clark, maybe some Towns Van Zandt. That's where that's where my uh, my tastes uh, tend to run, and and. Uh, you know, it's just too cruel to ask someone to choose one book. Um, I do like biography, and and so in some sense, it's it's not surprising that uh, that I ended up writing one. So I I I try to stick under my arm a few recent really great biographies. Okay, great. Well, listen, thank you very much, Cheryl, and I really enjoyed talking to you. It was wonderful having you a guest, and uh, I wish you all the best. Yes, well, thank you. It was really a pleasure, pleasure doing this with you.
clapping and a racing long before the snow. They got the urge for going, and they got the wings so they can go. They get the urge for going when the meadow grass is turned. Apply the fire with kindling.